Chapter One of the Efficiency Expert. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Efficiency Expert by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter One Jimmy Torrance, Jr. The gymnasium was packed as Jimmy Torrance stepped into the ring for the final event of the evening that was to decide the boxing championship of the university. Drawing to a close with the nearly four years of his college career, profitable years, Jimmy considered them, and certainly successful up to this point. In the beginning of his senior year he had captained the varsity eleven, and in the coming spring he would again sally forth upon the diamond as the star initial sacker of collegedom. His football triumphs were in the past. His continued baseball success is a foregone conclusion. If he won tonight, his cup of happiness and an unassailably dominant position among his fellows would be assured, leaving nothing more, in so far as Jimmy reasoned, to be desired from four years' attendance at one of America's oldest and most famous universities. The youth who would dispute the right to championship honors with Jimmy was a dark horse to the extent that he was a freshman, and therefore practically unknown. He had worked hard, however, and had given a good account of himself in his preparations for the battle, and there were rumors, as there always are about every campus, of marvelous exploits prior to his college days. It was even darkly hinted that he was a professional pugilist. As a matter of fact, he was the best exponent of the manly art of self-defense that Jimmy Torrance had ever faced, and in addition thereto he outweighed the senior and outreached him. The boxing contest, as the faculty members of the athletic committee preferred to call it, was from the tap of the gong as pretty a two-fisted scrap as ever any aggregation of low-browed fight fans witnessed. The details of this gory contest, while interesting, have no particular bearing upon the development of this tale. What interests us is the outcome, which occurred in the middle of a very bloody fourth round, in which Jimmy Torrance scored a clean knockout. It was a battered but happy Jimmy who sat in his room the following Monday afternoon, striving to concentrate his mind upon a college textbook which should, by all the laws of fiction, have been well thumbed, but in reality possessed unruffled freshness which belied its real age. I wish, mused Jimmy, that I could have got to the bird who invented mathematics before he inflicted all this unnecessary anguish upon an already unhappy world. In about three rounds I could have saved thousands from the sorrow which I feel every time I open this blooming book. He was still deeply engrossed in the futile attempt of accomplishing in an hour that for which the college curriculum set aside several months when there came sounds of approaching footsteps rapidly ascending the stairway. His door was unceremoniously thrown open, and there appeared one of those strange apparitions which is the envy and despair of the small-town youth, a naturally good-looking young fellow, the sartorial arts of whose tailor had elevated his waistline to his armpits, dragged down his shoulders, and caved in his front until he had the appearance of being badly dished from chin to knees. His trousers appeared to have been made for a man with legs six inches longer than his, while his hat was evidently several sizes too large, since it would have entirely extinguished his face had it not been supported by his ears. "'Hello, kid,' cried Jimmy. "'What's new?' "'Whiskers wants you.' replied the other. Faculty meeting. They just got through with me. Hell, muttered Jimmy feelingly. I don't know what Whiskers wants with me, but he never wants to see anybody about anything pleasant. I am here, agreed the other, to announce to the universe that you are right, Jimmy. He didn't have anything pleasant to say to me. In fact, he insinuated that dear old Alma Mater might be able to wiggle along without me if I didn't abjure my criminal life made some nasty comparison between my academic achievements and uh, fox-trotting. I wonder, Jimmy, how they get that way. That's why they are profs, explained Jimmy. There are two kinds of people in this world, human beings and profs. When does he want me? Now. Jimmy rose and pulled on his hat and coat. Goodbye, kid, 
he said. Pray for me and leave me one cigarette to smoke when I get back. And grinning, he left the room. James Torrance, Jr., was not greatly abashed as he faced the dour tribunal of the faculty. The younger members, among whom were several he knew to be mighty good fellows at heart, sat at the lower end of the long table, and with owlish gravity attempted to emulate the appearance and manners of their seniors. At the head of the table sat Whiskers, as the dignified and venerable president of the university was popularly named. It was generally believed, and solemnly sworn to throughout the large corps of undergraduates, that within the knowledge of any living man, Whiskers had never been known to smile. And today he was running true to form. Mr. Torrance, he said, sighing, it has been my painful duty on more than one occasion to call your attention to the uniformly low average of your academic standing. At the earnest solicitation of the faculty members of the athletic committee, I have been influenced, against my better judgment, to temporize with an utterly insufferable condition. You are rapidly approaching the close of your senior year, and in light of the records which I have before me, I am constrained to believe that it will be utterly impossible for you to graduate, unless, from now to the end of the semester, you devote yourself exclusively to your academic work. If you cannot assure me that you will do this, I believe it would be to the best interests of the university for you to resign now, rather than to fail of graduation and in this decision I am fully seconded by the faculty members of the Athletic Committee, who realize the harmful effect upon university athletics in the future were so prominent an athlete as you to fail at uh, graduation. If they had sentenced Jimmy to be shot at sunrise, the blow could scarcely have been more stunning than that which followed the realization that he was not to be permitted to round out his fourth successful season at first base. But if Jimmy was momentarily stunned, he gave no outward indication of the fact, and in the brief interval of silence following the President's ultimatum, his alert mind functioned with the rapidity which it had often shown upon the gridiron, the diamond, and the squared circle. Just for a moment, the thought of his being deprived of the pleasure and excitement of the coming baseball season filled his mind to the exclusion of every other consideration. But presently a less selfish impulse projected upon the screen of recollection the figure of the father he idolized. The boy realized the disappointment that this man would feel should his four years of college end thus disastrously and without the coveted diploma. And then it was that he raised his eyes to those of the President. "'I hope, sir,' he said, "'that you will give me one more chance, "'that you will let me go on as I have in the past, "'as far as baseball is concerned, "'with the understanding that if at the end of each month, "'between now and commencement, "'I do not show satisfactory improvement, "'I shall not be permitted to play on the team. "'But please don't make that restriction binding yet.' If, if I lay off the track work, I believe I can make up enough so that baseball will not interfere with my graduation. And so Whiskers, who was much more human than the student body gave him credit for being, and was in the bargain a good judge of boys, gave Jimmy another chance on his own terms, and the university's heavyweight champion returned to his room filled with determination to make good at the eleventh hour. Possibly one of the greatest obstacles which lay in Jimmy's path toward academic honors was the fact that he possessed those qualities of character which attracted others to him, with the result that there was seldom an hour during the day that he had his room to himself. On his return from the faculty meeting he found a half-dozen of his classmates there, awaiting his return. "'Well?' they inquired as he entered. "'It's worse than that.' said Jimmy, as he unfolded the harrowing details of what had transpired at his meeting with the faculty. "'And now,' he said, "'if you birds love me, keep out of here from now until commencement. 
there isn't a guy on earth can concentrate on anything with a room full of you mental ciphers sitting around and yapping about girls and other non-essential creations non-essential gasped one of his visitors letting his eyes wander over the walls of jimmy's study whereon were nailed pinned or hung countless framed and unframed pictures of non-essential creations all right jimmy said another we're with you horse foot and artillery when you want us give us the high sign and we will come otherwise we will leave you to your beloved books it is too bad though that as the bar boy was just explaining how the great drought might be circumvented by means of carrots potato peelings dish water and a raisin go on said jimmy i am not interested and the boys left him to his beloved books jimmy torrance worked hard and by dint of long hours and hard-working tutors he finished his college course and won his diploma nor did he have to forego the crowning honors of his last baseball season although like ulysses s grant he would have graduated at the head of his class had the list been turned upside down end of chapter one Chapter Two of the Efficiency Expert by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Two Jimmy Will Accept a Position. Following his graduation, he went to New York to visit with one of his classmates for a short time before returning home. He was a very self satisfied Jimmy nor who can wonder since almost from his matriculation there had been constantly dinned into his ears the plaudits of his fellow students jimmy torrance had been the one big outstanding feature of each successive class from his freshman to his senior year and as a junior and senior he had been the acknowledged leader of the student body and as popular a man as the university had ever known to his fellows as well as to himself he had been a great success the success of the university and he and they saw in the future only continued success in whatever vocation he decided to honor with his presence it was in a mental attitude that had become almost habitual with him and which was superinduced by these influences that jimmy approached the new life that was opening before him for a while he would play but in the fall it was his firm intention to settle down to some serious occupation and it was in this attitude that he opened a letter from his father the first that he had received since his graduation the letter was written on the letterhead of the beatrice corn mills incorporated beatrice nebraska and in the upper left hand corner in small type appeared james torrance senior president and general manager and this is what he read dear jim you have graduated i didn't think you would with honors in football baseball prize fighting and five thousand dollars in debt how you got your diploma is beyond me in my day you would have got the sack well son i am not surprised nor disappointed it is what i expected i know you are clean though and that some day you will awaken to the sterner side of life and an appreciation of your responsibilities to be an entirely um, orthodox father i should raise merry hell about your debts and utter inutility at the same time disinheriting you but instead i'm going to urge you to come home and run in debt here where the cost of living is not so high as in the east meanwhile praying that your awakening may come while i am on earth to rejoice your affectionate father i'm enclosing check to cover your debts and present needs for a long time the boy sat looking at the letter before him he reread it once twice three times and with each reading the film of unconscious egotism that had blinded him to his own shortcomings gradually became less opaque until finally he saw himself as his father must see him he had come to college for the purpose of fitting himself to succeed in some particular way in the stern battle of life which must follow his graduation 
for though his father had ample means to support him in indolence, Jimmy had never even momentarily considered such an eventuality. In weighing his assets now, he discovered that he had probably as excellent a conception of gridiron strategy and tactics as any man in America, that as a boxer he occupied a position in the forefront of amateur ranks, and he was quite positive that outside of the major leagues there was not a better first baseman. But in the last few minutes there had dawned upon him the realization that none of these accomplishments was greatly in demand in the business world. Jimmy spent a very blue and unhappy hour, and then slowly his natural optimism reasserted itself, and with it came the realization of his youth and strength and inherent ability, which, without egotism, he might claim. And then, too, he mused, I have my diploma. I am a college graduate, and that must mean something. If Dad had only reproached me, or threatened some condign punishment, I don't believe I should have feel half as badly as I do, but every line of that letter breathes disappointment in me, and yet, God bless him, he tells me to come home and spend his money there. <laughs> Not on your life. If he won't disinherit me, I am going to disinherit myself. I'm going to make him proud of me. He's the best dad a fellow ever had, and I'm going to show him that I appreciate him. And so he sat down and wrote his father this reply. Dear Dad, I have your letter and check. You may not believe it, but the former is worth more to me than the latter. Not, however, that I spurn the check, which it was just like you to send without a lot of grumbling and reproaches, even if I do deserve them. Your letter shows me what a rotten mess I have made of myself. I'm not going to hand you a lot of mush, Dad, but I want to try to do something that will give you reason to at least have hopes of rejoicing before I come home again. If I fail, I'll come home anyway, and then neither of us will have any doubt but what you will have to support me for the rest of my life. However, I, I don't intend to fail, and one of these days I will bob up all serene as president of a bank or a glue factory. In the meantime, I'll keep you posted as to my whereabouts, but don't send me another cent until I ask for it, and when I do, you will know that I have failed. Tell mother that I will write to her in a day or two, probably from Chicago, as I have always had an idea that that was one burg where I could make good. With lots of love to you all, your affectionate son. It was a hot July day that James Torrance, Jr. alighted from the 20th Century Limited at the LaSalle Street Station, and entering a cab directed that he be driven to a small hotel. For, he soliloquized, I might as well start economizing at once, as it might be several days before I land a job such as I want. In voicing which sentiments he spoke with the tongues of the prophets. Jimmy had many friends in Chicago, with whom upon the occasion of numerous previous visits to the western metropolis he had spent many hilarious and expensive hours. But now he had come upon the serious business of life, and there moved within him a strong determination to win financial success without recourse to the influence of rich and powerful acquaintances. Since the first crushing blow that his father's letter had dealt in his egotism, Jimmy's self-esteem had been gradually returning, though along new and more practical lines. His self-assurance was formed in a similar mold to those of all his other salient characteristics, and these conformed to his physical proportions, for physically, mentally, and morally Jimmy Torrance was big, not that he was noticeably taller than other men, or his features more than ordinarily attractive, but there was something so well balanced and harmonious in all the proportions of his frame and features as to almost invariably compel a second glance from even a casual observer, especially if the casual observer happened to be in the non-essential creation class. And so Jimmy, having had plenty of opportunity to commune with himself during the journey from New York, was confident that there were many opportunities awaiting him in Chicago. 
He remembered distinctly of having read somewhere that the growing need of big business concerns was competent executive material, that there were fewer big men than there were big jobs, and that if such was the case, all that remained to be done was to connect himself with the particular big job that suited him. In the lobby of the hotel he bought several of the daily papers, and after reaching his room he started perusing the help-wanted columns. Immediately he was impressed and elated by the discovery that there were plenty of jobs, and that a satisfactory percentage of them appeared to be big jobs. There were so many, however, that appealed to him as excellent possibilities, that he saw it would be impossible to apply for each and every one and then it occurred to him that he might occupy a more strategic position in the negotiations preceding his acceptance of a position if his future employer came to him first, rather than should he be the one to apply for the position. And so he decided the wisest plan would be to insert an ad in the Situations Wanted column, and then from the replies select those which most appealed to him, in other words, he would choose from the cream of those who desired the services of such a man as himself rather than risk the chance of obtaining a less profitable position through undue haste in seizing upon the first opening advertised. Having reached this decision and following his habitual custom, he permitted no grass to grow beneath his feet. Writing out an ad, he reviewed it carefully, compared it with others that he saw upon the printed page, made a few changes, rewrote it, and then descended to the lobby, where he called a cab and was driven to the office of one of the area's metropolitan morning newspapers. Jimmy felt very important as he passed through the massive doorway into the great general offices of the newspaper. Of course, he didn't exactly expect that he would be ushered into the presence of the president or business manager or that even the advertising manager would necessarily have to pass upon his copy, but there was within him a certain sensation that at that instant something was transpiring that in later years would be a matter of great moment, and he was really very sorry for the publishers of the newspaper that they did not know who it was who was inserting an ad in their Situations Wanted column. He could not help but watch the face of the young man who received his ad and counted the words, as he was sure that the clerk's facial expression would betray his excitement. It was a great moment for Jimmy Torrance. He realized that it was probably the greatest moment of his life, that here Jimmy Torrance ceased to be, and James Torrance, Jr., Esquire, began his career. But though he carefully watched the face of the clerk, he was finally forced to admit that the young man possessed wonderful control over his facial expressions. That bird has a regular poker face, mused Jimmy. Never batted an eye. And paying for his ad, he pocketed the change and walked out. Let's see, he figured. It will be in tomorrow morning's edition. The tired business man will read it either at breakfast or after he reaches his office. I understand that uh, there are three million people here in Chicago. Out of that three million, it is safe to assume that one million will read my advertisement. And of that one million, there must be at least one thousand who have responsible positions which are at present inadequately filled. Of course... The truth of the matter is that there are probably tens of thousands of such positions. But to be conservative, I will assume that there are only one thousand. And reducing it still further to almost an absurdity, I will figure that only ten percent of those reply to my advertisement. In other words, at the lowest possible estimate, I should have one hundred replies on the first day. I knew it was foolish to run it for three days. But the fellow insisted that was the proper way to do as I got a lower rate. By taking it for three days, however, it doesn't seem right to make so many busy men waste their time answering the ad, but I shall doubtless find a satisfactory position the first day. End of chapter 2「The Efficiency Expert」by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 3. 
the lizard. That night Jimmy attended a show, and treated himself to a lonely dinner afterward. He should have liked very much to have looked up some of his friends. A telephone call would have brought invitations to dinner and a pleasant evening with convivial companions. But he had mapped his course, and he was determined to stick it to the end. "'There will be plenty of time,' he thought, "'for amusement after I've gotten a good grasp on my new duties.' Jimmy elected to walk from the theater to his hotel, and as he was turning the corner from Randolph into La Salle, a young man jostled him. An instant later, the stranger was upon his knees, his wrist doubled suddenly backward and very close to the breaking point. "'What the hell are you doing?' he screamed. "'Pardon me,' replied Jimmy. "'You got your hand in the wrong pocket. I suppose you meant to put it in your own, but uh, you didn't.' "'Ah, oh, go on, leave me alone.' pleaded the stranger. I didn't get nothing. You, you ain't got the goods on me. Now, such a tableau as Jimmy and his new acquaintance formed cannot be staged at the corner of Randolph and LaSalle, beneath an arc light, even at midnight, without attracting attention. And so it was that before Jimmy realized it, a dozen curious pedestrians were approaching them from different directions, and a burly, blue-coated figure was shouldering his way forward. Jimmy had permitted his captive to rise, but he still held tightly to his wrist as the officer confronted them. He took one look at Jimmy's companion, and then grabbed him roughly by the arm. "'So it's you again, is it?' he growled. "'I ain't done nothing,' muttered the man. The officer looked inquiringly at Jimmy. "'What's all the excitement about?' asked the latter. "'My friend and I have done nothing.' "'Your friend and you,' replied the policeman. He ain't no friend of yours, I guess wouldn't be saying so. Well, I admit, replied Jimmy, that possibly I haven't known him long enough to presume to claim any close friendship, but there's no telling what time may develop. You don't want him pinched? asked the policeman. Of course not, replied Jimmy. Why should he be pinched? The officer turned roughly upon the stranger, shook him violently a few times, and then gave him a mighty shove which all but sent him sprawling into the gutter. "'Go on, witches!' he yelled after him. "'And if I see you on this beat again, I'll run you in! And you!' he turned upon Jimmy. "'You'd better be on your way, and not be after making up with every dip you meet!' "'Thanks,' said Jimmy. "'Have a cigar!' After the officer had helped himself and condescended to relax his stern features into the semblance of a smile, the young man bid him good night and resumed his way toward the hotel. Pretty early to go to bed, he thought as he reached for his watch to note the time, running his fingers into an empty pocket. Gingerly he felt in another pocket where he knew his watch couldn't possibly be, nor was. Carefully, Jimmy examined each pocket of his coat and trousers, a slow and broad grin illuminating his face. Well, what do you know about that? he mused. And I thought I was a wise guy. A few minutes after Jimmy reached his room, the office called him on the telephone to tell him that a man had called to see him. Send him up, said Jimmy, wondering who it might be, since he was sure that no one knew of his presence in the city. He tried to connect the call in some way with his advertisement, but inasmuch as that had been inserted blind, he felt that there could be no possible connection between that and his caller. A few minutes later there was a knock on his door, and in response to his summons to enter, the door opened, and there stood before him the young man of his recent encounter upon the street. The latter entered softly, closing the door behind him. His feet made no sound upon the carpet, and no sound came from the door as he closed it, nor any slightest click from the latch. His utter silence and the stealth of his movements were so pronounced as to attract immediate attention. He did not speak until he had reached the center of the room and halted on the opposite side of the table at which Jimmy was standing, and then a very slow smile moved his lips, though the expression of his eyes remained unchanged. "'Miss anything?' he asked. "'Yes,' said Jimmy. "'Here it is,' said the visitor, laying the other's watch upon the table. "'Why this uh, spasm of virtue?' asked Jimmy. "'Oh, I don't know,' replied the other. 
I guess it's because you're a white guy. O'Donnell has been trying to get something on me for the last year. He's got it in for me. I wouldn't cough every time the big stiff seen me. Sit down, said Jimmy. Nah, said the other. I gotta be going. Come, insisted the host. Sit down for a few minutes at least. I, I was just wishing that I had someone to talk to. The other sank noiselessly into a chair. All right, Bo, he said. Jimmy proffered him his cigar case. No, thanks, declined the visitor. I'd rather have a coffin nail, which Jimmy forthwith furnished. I should think, said Jimmy, that your particular line of endeavor would prove rather hazardous in a place where you are known by the police. The other smiled, and as before, with his lips alone. Nah, he said. This is the safest place to work. If ten percent of the bulls know me, I got that much on them. And then some, because any boob can spot any one of the harness bunch. And I know nearly every fly on the department. They're the guys you gotta know. And usually I know something besides their names, too. And again his lips smiled. How much of your time do you have to put in at your occupation to make a living? asked Jimmy. Oh, sometimes I put in six or eight hours a day, replied the visitor. The rush hours on the surface line are usually good for two or three hours a day, but I've been laying off that stuff lately and going in for the theater crowd. There's more money and shorter hours. Uh, you confine yourself, asked Jimmy, to uh, um, pocket picking solely? Again the lip smile. I'll tell you something, Bo, that they don't none of them big stiffs on the department know. The dip game is a stall. I learned it when I was a kid, and these yaps think that's all I know, and I keep them thinking it by pulling stuff under their noses often enough to give them the hunch that I'm still at the same old business. He leaned confidentially across the table. If you ever want a box cracked, look up the lizard. A meaning? asked Jimmy. Me, Bo, I'm the lizard. Box cracked, repeated Jimmy. An ice box or a hot box? His visitor grinned. Safe, he explained. Oh, said Jimmy, if I ever want anyone to break into a safe, come to you, huh? You get me, replied the other. <laughs> All right, said Jimmy, laughing. I'll call on you. That the only name you got, Mr. Lizard? That's all, just the lizard. Now I gotta be beating it. Uh, going to crack a box? asked Jimmy. The other smiled his lip smile and turned toward the door. Uh, wait a second, said Jimmy. What would you have gotten on this watch of mine? Oh, it would have stood me about twenty bucks. Jimmy reached into his pocket and drew forth a roll of bills. Here, he said, handing the other two tens. Nah, said the lizard, shoving the proffered money away. I'm no cheapskate. Come on, take it, said Jimmy. I may want a box cracked some day. All right, said the lizard, if you put it that way, Bo. I should think, said Jimmy, that a man of your ability could earn a living by less precarious methods. You would think so, replied the lizard. I've tried two or three times to go straight. Wore out my shoes looking for a job, never landed anything that paid me more than ten bucks per, and worked nine or ten hours a day, and half the time I couldn't get that. I suppose the police hounded you all the time, too, suggested Jimmy. Nah, said the lizard. That's all bunk. The fellas that couldn't even float down a sewer straight pulled that. Once in a while they get it in for some guy, but they're glad enough to leave us alone if we leave them alone. I worked uh, four hours today, maybe six before I get through, and I'll stand a chance of making all the way from fifty dollars to five thousand. Suppose I was driving a milk wagon, getting up at three o'clock in the morning and working like hell, how much would I get out of that? Expecting every minute someone was going to fire me? Nothing doing. They can't nobody fire me now. I'm my own boss. Well, said Jimmy, your logic sounds all right, but it all depends upon the viewpoint. But I'll tell you, you've offered me your services. I'll offer you mine. Whenever you want a job, look me up. I'm going to be general manager of a big concern here, and you'll find me in the next issue of the telephone directory. 
He handed the lizard his card. Thanks, said the latter. If you don't want a box cracked any sooner than I want a job, the chances are we'll never meet again. So long. And he was gone as noiselessly as he had come. Jimmy breakfasted at nine the next morning, and as he waited for his bacon and eggs, he searched the situations wanted columns of the morning paper until his eye finally alighted upon that for which he sought, the ad that was to infuse into the business life of the great city a new and potent force. Before his breakfast was served, Jimmy had read the few lines over a dozen times, and with each succeeding reading he was more and more pleased with the result of his advertising ability as it appeared in print. Wanted by college graduate. Position as general manager of large business where ability, energy, and experience will be appreciated. Address 263-S, Tribune Office. He had decided to wait until after lunch before calling at the newspaper office for replies to his advertisement, but during breakfast it occurred to him there probably would be several alert prospective employers who would dispatch their replies by special messengers, and realizing that promptness was one of the cardinal virtues in the business world, Jimmy reasoned that it would make a favorable impression were he to present himself as soon as possible after the receipt of replies. By a simple system of reasoning, he deduced that ten o'clock would be none too early to expect some returns from his ad, and therefore at ten promptly he presented himself at the want ad department in the Tribune office. Comparing the number of the receipt, which Jimmy handed him, with the numbers upon a file of little pigeonholes, the clerk presently turned back toward the counter with a handful of letters. Oh, thought Jimmy. I never would have guessed that I would receive a bunch like that so early in the morning. But then, as he saw the clerk running through them one by one, he realized that they were not all for him. And as the young man ran through them, Jimmy's spirits dropped a notch with each letter that was passed over without being thrown out to him. Until, uh, when the last letter had passed beneath the scrutiny of the clerk, and the advertiser realized that he had received no replies, he was sure that there had been some error. Nothing, said the clerk, shaking his head negatively. Are you sure you looked in the right compartment? asked Jimmy. Sure, replied the clerk. There is nothing for you. Jimmy pocketed his slip and walked from the office. This town is slower than I thought it was, he mused. I guess they do need some live wires here to manage their business. At noon he returned, only to be again disappointed, and then at two o'clock, and when he came in at four, the same clerk looked up wearily and shook his head. "'Nothing for you,' he said. "'I distributed all the stuff myself since you were in last.' As Jimmy stood there almost dazed by surprise that during an entire day his ad had appeared in Chicago's largest newspaper, and he had not received one reply— a man approached the counter, passed a slip similar to Jimmy's to the clerk, and received fully a hundred letters in return. Jimmy was positive now that something was wrong. Are you sure, he asked the clerk, that my replies haven't been sidetracked somewhere? I have seen people taking letters away from here all day, and that bird there just walked off with a fistful. The clerk grinned. What you advertising for? he asked. A position? replied Jimmy. "'There's the answer,' replied the clerk. "'That fellow there was advertising for help.'" End of chapter 3once again Jimmy walked out onto Madison Street, and, turning to his right, dropped into a continuous vaudeville show in an attempt to coax his spirits back to somewhere near their normal high-water mark. Upon the next day he again haunted the newspaper office without reward, and again upon the third day with similar results. To say that Jimmy was dumbfounded would be but a futile description of his mental state. 
it was simply beyond him to conceive that in one of the largest cities in the world the centre of a thriving district of fifty million souls there was no business man with sufficient acumen to realize how badly he needed james torrance jr to conduct his business for him successfully with the close of the fourth day and no reply jimmy was thoroughly exasperated the kindly clerk who by this time had taken a personal interest in this steadiest of customers suggested that jimmy try applying for positions advertised in the help wanted column and this he decided to do there were only two concerns advertising for general managers in the issue which jimmy scanned one ad called for an experienced executive to assume the general management of an old established sash door and blind factory the other insisted upon a man with mail-order experience to take charge of the mail-order department of a large department store. Neither of these were precisely what Jimmy had hoped for, his preference really being for the general management of an automobile manufactory, or possibly something in the airplane line. Sash, door, and blind sounded extremely prosaic and uninteresting to Mr. Torrance. The mail-order proposition, while possibly more interesting, struck him as being too trifling and unimportant. However, he thought, it will do no harm to have a talk with these people, and possibly I might even consider giving one of them a trial. And so, calling a taxi, he drove out onto the west side, where, in a dingy and squalid neighborhood, the taxi stopped in front of a grimy, unpainted, three-story brick building from which a great deal of noise and dust were issuing. Jimmy found the office on the second floor after ascending a narrow, dark, and dirty stairway. Jimmy's experience of manufacturing plants was uh, extremely limited, but he needed no experience as he entered the room to see that he was in a busy office of a busy plant. Everything about the office was plain and rather dingy, but there were a great many file clerks and typists and considerable bustling about. After stating his business to a young lady who sat behind a switchboard upon the front of which was the word information, and waiting while she communicated with an inner office over the telephone, he was directed in the direction of a glass partition at the opposite end of the room, a partition in which there were doors at intervals, and upon each door a name. He had been told that Mr. Brown would see him, and rapping upon the door bearing that name, he was bid to enter, and a moment later found himself in the presence of a middle-aged man whose every gesture and movement was charged with suppressed nerve energy. As Jimmy entered, the man was reading a letter. He finished it quickly, slapped it into a tray, and wheeled in his chair toward his collar. Well, he snapped as Jimmy approached him. I came in reply to your advertisement for a general manager, announced Jimmy confidently. The man sized him up quickly from head to foot, his eyes narrowed, and his brows contracted. What experience you had, who you been with, and how many years? He snapped the questions at Jimmy with the rapidity of machine-gun fire. I have the necessary ability, replied Jimmy, to manage your business. "'How many years have you had in the sash door and blind business?' snapped Mr. Brown. Oh, "'I have never had any experience in the sash door and blind business,' replied Jimmy. "'I didn't come here to make sash doors and blinds. I came here to manage your business.' Mr. Brown half rose from his chair. His eyes opened a little wider than normal. "'What that?' he started, and then, "'Well, of all that deep. Once again he found it impossible to go on. You came here to manage a sash door and blind factory, and you don't know anything about the business. Well, of all that— I assumed, said Jimmy, that what you wanted in a general manager was executive ability, and that's what I have. What you have, replied Mr. Brown, is a hell of a crust. Now run along, young fellow, I'm a very busy man, and don't forget to close the door after you as you go out. Jimmy did not forget to close the door. As he walked the length of the interminable room between rows of desks, before which were seated young men and young women, all of whom Jimmy thought were staring at him, he could feel the deep crimson burning upward from his collar to the roots of his hair. 
Never before in his life had Jimmy's self-esteem received such a tremendous jolt. He was still blushing when he reached his cab, and as he drove back toward the loop, he could feel successive hot waves suffuse his countenance at each recollection of the humiliating scene through which he had just passed. It was not until the next day that Jimmy had sufficiently re-established his self-confidence to permit himself to seek out the party who wished a mail-order manager, and while in this instance he met with very pleasant and gentlemanly treatment, his application was no less definitely turned down. For a month Jimmy trailed one job after another. At the end of the first week he decided that the street cars and sole leather were less expensive than taxicabs, as his funds were running perilously low, and he also lowered his aspirations successively from general managerships through department heads, assistants thereto, office managers, assistant office managers, and various other vocations, all with the same result, discovering meanwhile that experience while possibly not essential, as some of the ads stated, was usually the rock upon which his hopes were dashed. He also learned something else which surprised him greatly, that rather than being an aid to his securing employment, his college education was a drawback, several men telling him bluntly that they had no vacancies for rah-rah boys. At the end of the second week, Jimmy had moved from his hotel to a still less expensive one, and a week later to a cheap boarding house on the north side. At first he had written his father and mother regularly, but now he found it difficult to write them at all. Toward the middle of the fourth week, Jimmy had reached a point where he applied for a position as office boy. "'I'll be damned if I'm going to quit,' he said to himself. If I have to turn street sweeper, there must be some job here in the city that I'm capable of filling, and I'm pretty sure that I can at least get a job as an office boy. And so he presented himself to the office manager of a life insurance company that had advertised such a vacancy. A very kindly gentleman interviewed him. What experience have you had? he asked. Jimmy looked at him aghast. Do I have to have experience to be an office boy? he asked. Well, of course, replied the gentleman, it is not essential, but it is preferable. I already have applications from a dozen or more fellows, half of whom have had experience, and one in particular whom I have about decided to employ held a similar position with another life insurance company. Jimmy rose. Good day, he said, and walked out. That day he ate no lunch, but he had discovered a place where an abundance might be had for twenty-five cents if one knew how to order, and ordered judiciously. And so to this place he repaired for his dinner. Perched upon a high stool, he filled at least a corner of the aching void within. Sitting in his room that night, he took account of his assets and his liabilities. His room rent was paid until Saturday, and this was Thursday, and in his pocket were one dollar and sixty cents. Opening his trunk, he drew forth a sheet of paper and an envelope, and clearing the top of the rickety little table which stood at the head of his bed, he sat down on the soiled counterpane and wrote a letter. Dear Dad, I guess I'm through. I have tried and failed. It is hard to admit it, but I guess I'll have to. If you will send me the price, I'll come home with love, Jim. Slowly he folded the letter and inserted it in the envelope, his face mirroring an utter dejection such as Jimmy Torrance had never before experienced in his life. Failure, he muttered. Unutterable failure. Taking his hat, he walked down the creaking stairway with its threadbare carpet and out onto the street to post his letter. End of chapter 4、Chapter、Five of The Efficiency Expert by Edgar Rice Burroughs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter 5 
Jimmy Land's one. Miss Elizabeth Compton sat in the dimly lighted library upon a deep cushioned tapestried sofa. She was not alone, yet although there were many comfortable chairs in the large room, and the sofa was an exceptionally long one, she and her companion occupied but little more space than would have comfortably accommodated a single individual. Stop it, Harold, she admonished. I utterly loathe being mauled. But I can't help it, dear. It, it seems so absolutely wonderful. I can't believe it, that you are really mine. But I'm not, yet, exclaimed the girl. There are a lot of formalities and bridesmaids and ministers and things that have got to be taken into consideration before I am yours. And anyway, there is no necessity for mussing me up so. You might as well know now as later that I utterly loathe this caveman stuff. And really, Harold, there is nothing about your appearance that suggests a caveman, which is probably one reason that I like you. Like me, exclaimed the young man. I thought you loved me. I have to like you in order to love you, don't I? She parried. And one certainly has to like the man she is going to marry. Well, grumbled Mr. Bince, you might be more enthusiastic about it. I prefer, explained the girl, to be loved decorously. I do not care to be pawed or clawed, or crumpled. After we have been married for um, fifteen or twenty years, and are really well acquainted... Possibly you will permit me to kiss you, Bince finished for her. Don't be silly, Harold, she retorted. You have kissed me so much now that my hair is all down and my face must be a sight. Lips are what you are supposed to kiss with. You don't have to kiss with your hands. "'Possibly I was a little bit rough. I am sorry,' apologized the young man. "'But when a fellow has just been told by the sweetest girl in the world that she will marry him, it's enough to make him a little bit crazy.' "'Not at all,' rejoined Miss Compton. "'We should never forget the stratum of society to which we belong, and what we owe to the maintenance of the position we hold. My father has always impressed upon me the fact that gentlemen or gentlewomen are always gentle folk under any and all circumstances and conditions i distinctly recall his remark about one of his friends whom he greatly admired to this effect that he had always got drunk like a gentleman therefore we should do everything as gentlefolk should do things and when we make love we should make love like gentlefolks and not like hog carriers or cavemen yes said the young man now try to remember it was a little after nine o'clock when harold bince arose to leave i'll drive you home volunteered the girl just wait and i'll have barry bring the roadster around i thought we should always do the things a gentle folk should do said bince grinning after being seated safely in the car they had turned out of the driveway into lincoln parkway what do you mean asked elizabeth is it perfectly proper for young ladies to drive around the streets of a big city alone after dark oh but i'm not alone she said you will be after you leave me at home oh well i'm different and i'm glad that you are exclaimed bince fervently i wouldn't love you if you were like the ordinary run Bince lived at one of the downtown clubs, and after depositing him there and parting with a decorous hand-clasp, the girl turned her machine and headed north for home. At Erie Street came a sudden loud hissing of escaping air. Dump! exclaimed Miss Elizabeth Compton, as she drew in beside the curb and stopped. Although she knew perfectly well that one of the tires was punctured, she got out and walked around in front as though in search of the cause of the disturbance, and sure enough there it was, flat as a pancake, the left front tire. There was an extra wheel on the rear of the roadster, but it was heavy and cumbersome, and the girl knew from experience what a dirty job changing a wheel is. She had just about decided to drive home on the rim, when a young man crossed the walk from Erie Street and joined her in her doleful appraisement of the punctured casing. Uh, "'Can I help you any?' he asked. She looked up at him. Uh, "'Thank you,' she replied. "'But I think I'll drive home on it as it is.' 
They can change it there. It looks like a new casing, he said. It would be too bad to ruin it. If you have a spare, I will be glad to change it for you. And without waiting for her acquiescence, he stripped off his coat, rolled up his shirt sleeves, and dove under the seat for the jack. Elizabeth Compton was about to protest, but there was something about the way in which the stranger went at the job that indicated that he would probably finish it if he wished to, in spite of any arguments she could advance to the contrary. As he worked, she talked with him, discovering not only that he was a rather nice person to look at, but that he was equally nice to talk to. She could not help but notice that his clothes were rather badly wrinkled and that his shoes were dusty and well-worn for when he kneeled in the street to operate the jack, the sole of one shoe was revealed beneath the light of an adjacent arc, and she saw that it was badly worn. Evidently he was a poor young man. She had observed these things almost unconsciously, and yet they made their impression upon her, so that when he had finished she recalled them, and was emboldened thereby to offer him a bill in payment for his services. He refused, as she had almost expected him to do for while his clothes and his shoes suggested that he might accept a gratuity, his voice and his manner belied them. During the operation of changing the wheel, the young man had a good opportunity to appraise the face and figure of the girl, both of which he found entirely to his liking, and when finally she started off after thanking him, he stood upon the curb watching the car until it disappeared from view. Slowly he drew from his pocket an envelope which had been addressed and stamped for mailing, and very carefully he tore it into small bits which he dropped into the gutter. He could not have told had anyone asked him what prompted him to the act. A girl had come into his life for an instant, and had gone out again, doubtless forever, and yet in that instance Jimmy Torrance had taken a new grasp upon his self-esteem. It might have been the girl, and again it might not have been. He could not tell. Possibly it was the simple little act of refusing the tip she had proffered him. It might have been any one of a dozen little different things, or an accumulation of them all, that had brought back a sudden flood of the old self-confidence and optimism. "'Tomorrow,' said Jimmy as he climbed into bed, "'I am going to land a job.' And he did. In the department store, to the general managership of whose mail-order department he had aspired, Jimmy secured a position in the hosiery department at ten dollars a week. The department buyer who had interviewed him asked him what experience he had had with ladies' hosiery. "'About uh, four or five years,' replied Jimmy. "'By whom did you work?' "'I was in business for myself,' replied the applicant. Both in the West and in the East, I got my first experience in a small town in Nebraska, but I carried on a larger business in the East later. So they gave Jimmy a trial in a new section of the hosiery department, wherein he was the only male clerk. The buyer had discovered that there was a sufficient proportion of male customers, many of whom displayed evident embarrassment in purchasing hosiery from young ladies, to warrant putting a man clerk in one of the sections for this class of trade. The fact of the matter was, however, that the astute buyer was never able to determine the wisdom of his plan, since Jimmy's entire time was usually occupied in waiting upon impressionable young ladies. However, inasmuch as it redounded to the profit of the department, the buyer found no fault. Possibly, if Jimmy had been almost any other type of man from what he was, his presence would not have been so flamboyantly noticeable in a hosiery department. His stature, his features, and his bronzed skin, that had lost nothing of its bronze in his month's search for work through the hot summer streets of the big city, were as utterly out of place as would have been the salient characteristics of a chorus girl in a blacksmith shop. For the first week Jimmy was frightfully embarrassed, and to his natural bronze, was added an almost continuous flush of mortification from the moment that he entered the department in the morning until he left it at night. "'It is a job, however,' he thought, "'and ten dollars is better than nothing. I can hang on to it until something better turns up.' With his income now temporarily fixed at the amount of his wages, he was forced to find a less expensive boarding-place, 
although at the time he had rented his room he had been quite positive that there could not be a cheaper or more undesirable habitat for man. Transportation and other considerations took him to a place on Indiana Avenue near 18th Street, from whence he found he could walk to and from work, thereby saving ten cents a day. And believe me, he cogitated, I need the ten. Jimmy saw little of his fellow rumors. A strange drab lot, he thought them, from the occasional glimpses he had in passings upon the dark stairway and in the gloomy halls. They appeared to be quiet, inoffensive sort of folk, occupied entirely with their own affairs. He had made no friends in the place, not even an acquaintance, nor did he care to. What leisure time he had, he devoted to what he now had come to consider as his life work, the answering of blind ads in the help-wanted columns of one morning and one evening paper, the two mediums which seemed to carry the bulk of such advertising. For a while he had sought a better position by applying during the noon hour to such places as gave an address close enough to the department store in which he worked to permit him to make the attempt during the forty-five-minute period he was allowed for his lunch but he soon discovered that nine-tenths of the positions were filled before he arrived, and that in the few cases where they were not, he not only failed of employment, but was usually so delayed that he was late in returning to work afternoon. By replying to blind ads evenings, he could take his replies to the two newspaper offices during his lunch hour, thereby losing no great amount of time. Although he never received a reply, he still persisted as he found the attempt held something of a fascination for him, similar probably to that which holds the lottery devotee or the searcher after buried treasure. There was always a chance that he would turn up something big. And so another month dragged by slowly. His work in the department store disgusted him. It seemed such a silly, futile occupation for a full-grown man and he was always fearful that the sister or sweetheart or mother of some of his Chicago friends would find him there behind the counter in the hosiery section. The store was a large one, including many departments, and Jimmy tried to persuade the hosiery buyer to arrange for his transfer to another department where his work would be more in keeping with his sex and appearance. He rather fancied the automobile accessories line, but the buyer was perfectly satisfied with Jimmy's sales record and would do nothing to assist in the change. The university heavyweight champion had reached a point where he loathed but one thing more than he did silk hosiery, and that one thing was himself. End of chapter 5《Six of the Efficiency Expert by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Chapter Six Harold Plays the Raven. Mason Compton, President and General Manager, sat in his private office in the works of the International Machine Company, chewing upon an unlighted cigar and occasionally running his fingers through his iron gray hair as he compared and recompared two statements which lay upon the desk before him. Damn strange, he muttered as he touched a button beneath the edge of his desk. A boy entered the room. Ask Mr. Bince if he will be good enough to step in here for a moment, please, said Compton. And a moment later, when Harold Bince entered, the older man leaned back in his chair and motioned the other to be seated. I can't understand these statements, Harold, said Compton. Here is one for August of last year, and this is this August's statement of costs. We never had a better month in the history of this organization than last month, and yet our profits are not commensurate with the volume of business that we did. That's the reason I sent for these cost statements and have compared them, and I find that our costs have increased out of all proportion to what is warranted. How do you account for it? Principally the increased cost of labor, replied Bince. And the same holds true of everybody else. Every manufacturer in the country is in the same plight we are. I know, agreed Compton, that this is true to some measure. 
both labor and raw materials have advanced but we have advanced our prices correspondingly in some cases it seems to me that our advance in prices particularly on our specialties should have given us uh, even a handsomer profit over the increased cost of production than we formerly received in the last six months since i appointed you assistant manager i am afraid that i have sort of let things get out of my grasp i have a lot of confidence in you harold and now that you and elizabeth are engaged i feel even more inclined to let you shoulder the responsibilities that i have carried alone from the inception of this organization but i've got to be mighty sure that you're going to do at least as well as i did you have shown a greater deal of ability but you are young and haven't had the advantage of the years of experience and made it possible for me to finally develop a business second to none in this line in the west i never had a son and after elizabeth's mother died i have lived in the hope somehow that she would marry the sort of chap who would really take the place of such a son as every man dreams of some one who will take his place and carry on his work when he is ready to lay aside his tools i like your father harold he was one of the best friends that i ever had and i can tell you now what i couldn't have told you a month ago that when i employed you and put you in this position it was with the hope that eventually you would fill the place in my business and in my home of the son that i uh, never had do you think elizabeth guessed what was in your mind asked vince i don't know replied the older man i have tried never to say anything to influence her years ago when she was younger we used to talk about it uh, half jokingly and shortly after you told me of your engagement she remarked to me one day that she was happy for she knew you were going to be the sort of son i had wanted i haven't anybody on earth but her harold and when i die she gets the business i have arranged it in my will so that you too will share and share alike in profits after i go but that will be some time i'm far from being an old man and i am a mighty healthy one however i should like to be relieved of the active management there are a lot of things that i've always wanted to do that i couldn't do because i couldn't spare the time from my business and so i want you to get thoroughly into the harness as soon as possible that i may turn over the entire management to you but i can't do it harold while the profits are diminishing as the older man's gaze fell again to statements before him the eyes of the younger man narrowed just a trifle as they rested upon mason compton and then as the older man looked up bince's expression changed i'll do my best sir he said smiling of course i realize as you must that i have tried to learn a great deal in a short time i think i have reached a point now where i pretty thoroughly grasp the possibilities and requirements of my work and i am sure that from now on you will note a decided change for the better on the right side of the ledger i am sure of it my boy said compton heartily don't think that i've been finding fault with anything you've done i just wanted to call your attention to these figures they mean something and it's up to you to find out just what they do mean and then there came a light tap on the door which opened immediately before any summons to enter had been given and elizabeth compton entered followed by another young woman hello there exclaimed compton what gets us out so early and harriet too <laughs> there's only one thing that would bring you girls in here so early and what's that asked elizabeth you are going shopping and elizabeth wants some money they all laughed you're a regular sherlock holmes exclaimed harriet holden how much asked compton of his daughter still smiling how much have you asked elizabeth i am utterly broke compton turned to bince 
"'Get her what she needs, Harold,' he said. The young man started to the door. "'Come with me, Elizabeth,' he said. "'We will go out to the cashier's cage and get you fixed up.' They entered Bince's office, which adjoined Compton's. "'Wait here a minute, Elizabeth,' said Bince. "'How much do you want? I'll get it for you and bring it back. I want to see you a moment alone before you go.' She told him how much she wanted, and he was back shortly with the currency. "'Elizabeth,' he said, "'I don't know whether you have noticed it or not, because your father isn't a man to carry his troubles home. But I believe that he is failing rapidly, largely from overwork. He worries about conditions here which really do not exist. I've been trying to take the load off his shoulders so that he could ease up a bit, but he has got into a rut from which he cannot be guided.' He will simply have to be lifted completely out of it, or he will stay here and die in harness. Everything is running splendidly. Now that I have a good grasp of the business, I can handle it. Don't you suppose you could uh, persuade him to take a trip? I know that he wants to travel. He's told me so several times. And if uh, he could get away from here this fall and stay away for a year, if possible, it would make a new man of him. I am really very much worried about him, and while I hate to worry you, I feel that you are the only person who can influence him and that something ought to be done, and done at once. Why, Harold, exclaimed the girl, there's nothing the matter with father. He was never better in his life, nor more cheerful. That is the side of him he lets you see, replied the man. His gaiety is all forced. If you could see him after you leave, you would realize that he is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Your father is not an old man in years, but he has placed a constant surtax on his nervous system for the last twenty-five years without a let-up, and it doesn't make any difference how good a machine may be. It is going to wear out some day, and the better the machine, the more complete will be the wreck when the final break occurs. As he spoke, he watched the girl's face, the changing expression of it, which marked her growing mental perturbation. "'You really believe it is as bad as that, Harold?' she asked. "'It may be worse than I think,' he said. "'It is surely fully as bad.' The girl rose from her chair. "'I will try and persuade him to see Dr. Earle. The man took a step toward her. "'I don't believe a doctor is what he needs,' he said quickly. "'His condition is one that even a nerve specialist might not diagnose correctly. "'It is only someone in a position like mine, "'who has an opportunity to observe him almost hourly, day by day, "'who would realize his condition. "'I doubt if he has any organic trouble whatever. "'What he needs is a long rest, entirely free from any thought whatever of business.' At least, Elizabeth, it will do him no harm, and it may prolong his life for years. I wouldn't go messing around with any of these medical chaps. Well, she said at last with a sigh, I will talk to him and see if I can't persuade him to take a trip. He's always wanted to visit Japan and China. Just the thing, exclaimed Bince. Just the thing for him. The long sea voyage will do him a world of good, and now he said, stepping to her side and putting an arm around her. She pushed him gently away. No, she said, I do not feel like kissing now. And turning, she entered her father's office, followed by Bince. End of chapter 6「This is a
the girl for whom he had changed a wheel a month before and who unconsciously had infused new ambition into his blood and saved him temporarily at least from becoming a quitter he noticed as he waited on her that she seemed to be appraising him very carefully and at times there was a slightly puzzled expression on her face but evidently she did not recognize him and finally when she had concluded her purchases he was disappointed that she paid for them in cash he had rather hoped that she would have them charged and sent that he might learn her name and address and then she left with jimmy none the wiser concerning her other than that her first name was elizabeth and that she was even better looking than he recalled her to have been and the girl with her exclaimed jimmy mentally she was no slouch either they are the two best-looking girls i've seen in this town notwithstanding the fact that whether one likes chicago or not he's got to admit that there are more pretty girls here than in any other city in the country i'm glad she didn't recognize me of course i don't know her and the chances are that i never shall but i should hate to have anyone recognize me here or hereafter as that young man at the stocking counter Gad but it's beastly that a regular life-size man should be selling stockings to women for a living or rather for a fraction of a living while jimmy had always been hugely disgusted with his position the sight of the girl seemed to have suddenly crystallized all those weeks of self-contempt into a sudden almost mad desire to escape what he considered his degrading and effeminating surroundings one must bear with jimmy and judge him leniently for after all notwithstanding his college diploma and physique he was still but a boy and so while it is difficult for a mature and sober judgment to countenance his next step if one can look back a few years to one's own youth he can at least find extenuating circumstances surrounding jimmy's seeming foolishness for with a bang that caused startled clerks in all directions to look up from their work he shattered the decorous monotone of the great store by slamming his sales book viciously upon the counter and without a word of explanation to his fellow clerks marched out of the section toward the buyer's desk well mr torrance asked that gentleman what can i do for you i'm going to quit announced jimmy quit exclaimed the buyer why why, what's wrong? Isn't everything perfectly uh, satisfactory? You, uh, uh, you never complained to me. I can't explain, replied Jimmy. I'm going to quit. I'm not satisfied. I'm going to uh, accept another position. The buyer raised his eyebrows. Ah, oh, he said, with, uh, and he named their closest competitor. No, said Jimmy. I'm going to get a regular he-job. The other smiled. Uh, if an uh, increase in salary, he suggested, would influence you, I, I had intended to tell you that I would take care of you beginning next week. I thought of making it uh, fifteen dollars. And with that unanswerable argument for Jimmy's continued service, the buyer sat back and folded his hands. "'Nothing stirring,' said Jimmy. "'I wouldn't sell another sock if you paid me ten thousand dollars a year. I am through.' "'Oh, very well,' said the buyer, aggrievedly. "'But if you leave me this way, you will be unable to refer to the house.' But nothing, not even a team of oxen, could have held Jimmy in that section another minute. And so he got his pay and left with nothing more in view than a slow death by starvation." there exclaimed elizabeth compton as she sank back on the cushions of her car there what asked harriet i have placed him whom that nice-looking young person who waited on us in the hosiery section oh said harriet it was good-looking wasn't he but he looked out of place there and i think he uh, felt out of place did you notice how he flushed when he asked you what size <laughs> and the girls laughed heartily at the recollection but uh, where have you ever met him before harriet asked i have never met him corrected elizabeth accenting the met he changed a wheel on the roadster several weeks ago one evening after i had taken harold down to the club and he was very nice about it i should say that he is a gentleman 
although his clothes were pretty badly worn. Yes, said Harriet, his suit was shabby, but his linen was clean and his coat well brushed. Ma! exclaimed Elizabeth. He must have made an impression on someone. Well, said Harriet, it isn't often you see such a nice-looking chap in the hosiery section. No, said Elizabeth, and probably if he were as nice as he looks, he wouldn't be there. Whereupon the subject was changed, and she promptly forgot Mr. Jimmy Torrance. But Jimmy was not destined soon to forget her, for as the jobless days passed and he realized more and more what an ass he had made of himself, and why, he had occasion to think about her a great deal, although never in any sense reproaching her. He realized that the fault was his own, and that he had done a foolish thing in giving up his position because of a girl he did not know and probably never would. There came a Saturday when Jimmy, jobless and fundless, dreaded his return to the Indiana Avenue rooming house, where he knew the landlady would be eagerly awaiting him, for he was a week in arrears in his room rent already, and had been warned he could expect no further credit. "'There's a nice young man wanting your room,' the landlady had told him, "'and I shall have to be having it Saturday night, unless you can pay up.' Jimmy stood on the corner of Clark and Van Buren looking at his watch. "'I hate to do it,' he thought. "'But the lizard said he could get twenty for it, and twenty would give me another two weeks.' And so his watch went and two weeks later his cigarette case and ring followed. Jimmy had never gone in much for jewelry, a fact which he now greatly lamented. Some of the clothes he still had were good, though badly in want of pressing, and when, after still further days of fruitless searching for work, the proceeds from the articles he had pawned were exhausted, it occurred to him he might raise something on all but what he actually needed to cover his nakedness. In his search for work he was still wearing his best-looking suit, the others he would dispose of, and with this plan in his mind on his return to his room that night, he went to the tiny closet to make a bundle of the things which he would dispose of on the morrow, only to discover that in his absence someone had been there before him, and that there was nothing left for him to sell. It would be two days before his room rent was again due, but in the meantime Jimmy had no money wherewith to feed the inner man. It was an almost utterly discouraged Jimmy who crawled into his bed to spend a sleepless night of worry and vain regret, the principal object of his regret being that he was not the son of a blacksmith who had taught him how to shoe horses, and who at the same time had been too poor to send him to college. Long since there had been driven into his mind the conviction that for any practical purpose of life a higher education was as useless as the proverbial fifth wheel to the coach. And even, mused Jimmy, if I had graduated at the head of my class, I would be no better off than I am now. End of chapter 7